Welcome to the Physiology Corner. We'll start off today by looking at research presented in class whose results demonstrate the problem we are going to address. After both lean and obese individuals performed a bout of exercise at the same maximum workload, we can see that lean individuals experienced a significant increase in PGC1-alpha, while obese individuals did not. The problem that we are looking to teach the solution to is why exercise-mediated increases in PGC1-alpha are impaired in obese individuals. We will present and further explore this problem within the context of the conservation of mass model. In this problem, our mass will be active PGC1-alpha. Our P1 for inflow is PGC1-alpha content. Our P2 is our mass, active PGC1-alpha. Because we have not yet discussed the outflow of active PGC1-alpha in class, we will only be looking at the factors affecting inflow. Our conductance is ANPK, CAMK, and P38, and CERT1. Let's now eliminate some possible mechanisms as to why we see an impaired increase in PGC1-alpha in obese individuals. As shown in Table 3, Exercise Characteristics, we can see that both the lean and obese individuals had the same VO2 peak and were working at the same maximum heart rate and maximum workload. Therefore, we can assume that they have similar fitness levels and thus will have similar mitochondrial content. Because of their similar mitochondrial content and energetic status, the ATP breakdown and the AMP and ADP buildup would be the same for both individuals. Therefore, AMPK's ability to increase inflow into activated PGC1-alpha would not be lower in obese individuals. AMPK would not be the reason we see impaired increases in PGC1-alpha in obese individuals. CAMK and P38 are activated with increases in calcium following a muscle contraction. Because the lean and obese individuals are both working at the same relative intensity and maximum workload, we would not expect to see differences in calcium levels between these two groups. Therefore, CAMK and P38 activation would be the same and would activate PGC1-alpha to the same extent in the, both the lean and obese individuals. Therefore, CAMK and P38 would not be the reason we see impaired increases in PGC1-alpha in obese individuals. Alpha. CERT1 can be activated by two separate pathways. The first is through epinephrine. Epinephrine results in a signaling cascade that activates PKA, which eventually activates CERT1. Usually with training, the amount of epinephrine released during a bout of exercise is decreased. Because we are assuming that both lean and obese individuals have the same training levels, uh, we can assume that epinephrine will be the same in both groups. Therefore, the activation of CERT1 via this pathway would be the same in both individuals as well. The second way in which CERT1 is activated is through this AMPK pathway. As we've previously discussed, AMPK is the same in both lean and obese individuals. So, as this is the same, NAMT will be activated to the same extent, as well as the conversion of NADH to NAD+, which would activate CERT1 to the same extent in both individuals. Therefore, by looking at both activation pathways of CERT1, we can see that it is not a determining factor in the impairment of activating PGC1 in obese individuals. As we have shown, these three factors for conductance for inflow to PGC1-alpha are the same in both lean and obese individuals. Therefore, it must be P1 or PGC1-alpha content that is contributing to the difference in inflow to active PGC1-alpha seen between lean and obese individuals after a bout of exercise. We hypothesize that initial PGC1-alpha levels in obese individuals will be lower than in lean individuals. To determine if our hypothesis is plausible, we looked at a study by Holloway and colleagues titled PGC1-alpha's relationship with skeletal muscle palmitate oxidation is not present with obesity despite maintained PGC1-alpha and PGC1-beta. The purpose of the study was to determine whether the protein contents of various transcription factors, including PGC1-alpha, were reduced in skeletal muscle of 9 obese and 9 age-matched lean women. A sample of the participants' rectus abdominis muscle following an overnight fast was collected, and western blotting was used to determine the PGC1-alpha content of the muscle. 
The results show that there was no difference in skeletal muscle protein content of PGC1-alpha between lean and obese individuals. These results are illustrated in Figure 4 of the Holloway and colleagues paper. The data from Holloway and colleagues suggests that the amount of PGC1-alpha in both lean and obese individuals was the same following an overnight fast. To conclude, we cannot confidently provide a solution as to why we are seeing an impaired increase in PGC1-alpha in obese individuals as compared to lean individuals following a bout of exercise. Future research should explore the possibility of increased levels of inhibitors such as GCN5 and RIP140 playing a role in the impairment of increasing PGC1-alpha following a bout of exercise in obese individuals.